Tens of thousands of American high school students were taught as scientific fact that there are five races. This one is the highest race. And that was supposedly scientific. That was the science of the day. That was, that was you know, printed in textbooks because that's the truth, right? But you'd be really hard pressed today to find an evolutionist who agrees with that. Why is that? Well, it's because science did not confirm evolutionary ideas when it came to race. They were completely, totally, utterly wrong. And my topic today is only one race, the biblical answer to racism. This is such a huge issue in our culture today with all kinds of different ways of thinking about it, with our culture pushing a very specific way. How can we as Christians think biblically about this issue? Because when it comes to any issue, we want to be making sure we're starting with the authority of the word of God to answer any question that we may have. And oftentimes, people will look at the world around them, particularly Christians, and they'll be like, okay, well, if we all come from Adam and Eve, why are all the different races all around the world. Where all the races come from if we're all descended from Adam and Eve? How do we understand the Bible's history in light of this idea of races? What do we do about all this? Well, we always wanna make sure that we're starting with God's word because ultimately, when it comes to any issue we could be talking about, whether it's this issue or, or any other, there's really only two ways of thinking about it. We either start with the authority of the word of God or we don't start with God's word and the only other option is man's word. Those are the only two options we have when it comes to the foundation for our thinking. It's either God's word or it's man's word. We're either building a worldview based on the authority of the word of God, where we, like putting on a pair of glasses, right? It colors, it changes the way that you look at the world. And we either start with God's word as the absolute authority through which we view the world, or if we ignore that and we start with man's word, then we're looking at the world through the lens that man determines truth, man determines right from wrong, Man gets to determine um, what is absolute. And of course, that is very subjective in our culture. We see that all the time. It's constantly changing because people's opinions are constantly changing. People's beliefs are constantly changing. The culture is constantly changing. So we have the absolute unshakable authority of God's word or we have the ever-changing opinions of man. Those are the only two options we have. And depending on your starting point, you're gonna build a very different worldview based on that starting point. And when it comes to that secular worldview based on the authority that, uh, of man's word, that really comes out of um, evolutionary ideology, right? If we're just descended from the animals, if we're just descended from some kind of ape-like creature, then there is no God. There is no ultimate authority. Mankind is the ultimate. So we get to be our own gods. We get to determine right from wrong truth for ourselves. And of course, that's the worldview we see dominating Western culture today, which is very different from when we start with God's word and we understand no, God created us from the very beginning. And so God is the one who is the authority. God is the one who determines right from wrong. God determines truth, and he's given that to us in his word. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through the history that God has given us in his word, what we summarize here at the Creation Museum as the seven C's of history. We're going to go through that history and see how what God has told us in his word about our origins, and particularly about the gospel message, that answers this question of race and racism, and what do we do about all of this? When we start with God's word, we have have answers for our own lives and answers for our culture. So starting at the very beginning with the very first sea of history, creation, God created everything, right? God made everything. The Bible tells us in six literal 24-hour days. Genesis 1 tells us that. Exodus 2011 confirms, yes, it was six literal 24-hour days. And we know that God's original creation was very good. Genesis 131 tells us that when God looked at everything he made, he said, behold, it is very good. It was perfect. There's no death or suffering or pain in God's original creation. There's no sin. Um, none of that is part of God's original creation. And of course, we know that God created just two people at the very beginning. Adam and Eve placed them in the, the Garden of Eden. And that brings us to the second sea of history, which is corruption. Where Adam and Eve, those first two people, they rebelled against God's command. And their choice to rebel brought death and suffering and disease into God's once very good creation. It's because of this event in history that we live in a world now that is groaning, as Romans 8 says, groaning because of our sin. In the Garden of Eden, you have 
perfect relationship between God and man. You have perfect relationship between um, man and woman, right? There's, there's no strife. There's nothing until sin enters creation. And then very quickly, everything just, it goes really badly, really quickly, right? You have Genesis chapter three, where mankind sins against God. And then God is asking, where are you? And then Ad, they're hiding. And then Adam's blaming Eve and Eve's blaming the serpent. And it's just the disintegration of relationships happens so quickly. And then you get to just Genesis chapter four, and you have the very first murder where Adam and Eve's son Cain murders his brother Abel out of jealousy. So you very quickly see just the breakdown of human relationships because now sin is part of creation. And when it comes to Cain and Abel, there's a question a lot of people have because you read about Cain after he kills Abel and God sends him away, it mentions Cain's wife. And then people, hold up, wait a second, where did she come from? You've got Adam and Eve, you've got Cain and Abel, where did, where, where did Cain get his wife from? That's a very common question that people have. And when I was a high school student in youth, uh, youth group, one of the kids in the youth uh, class asked uh, the teacher that question. He was like, where, you know, it says in here that Cain got a wife. Where on earth did he, did Cain get his wife from? And the youth leader, she stopped for a few minutes and she was like, uh, that is a great question. Um, you know, there must have just been a group of people living at the same time as Adam and Eve, the Bible doesn't mention, and Cain just must have married somebody from that group of people. And then she moved on. But what she really should have done is gone back to, what does the word of God actually say for how we should answer this question? Because God's word is very clear that God created just one man and one woman. We read in Genesis 127 about God creating mankind in his own image, male and female, bringing that male and female together in marriage. Here we have the definition of marriage, right? The very first marriage there in Genesis. Um, first Corinthians emphasizes what's taught all throughout scripture that Adam was the first man. Genesis 3.20 tells us that the man, Adam, called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. So if Adam is the first man and Eve is the mother of all the living, every single person must be descended from Adam and Eve. That's why in Acts 17, 26, Paul says that God has made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Everyone comes from just one man, the man, Adam and his wife, Eve. So you can't appeal to another group of people and be like, oh, well, there must've just been these other people here. The Bible doesn't mention them. Um, first of all, that doesn't match with what scripture says about everybody being descended from Adam and Eve. And it creates a huge theological problem because now you have people who aren't related to Adam, who didn't sin in Adam, but they're going to suffer the consequences of Adam's sin, even though they had no relation to Adam. It creates a huge problem. We don't need to go there. We need to stick with what the Bible says. And God's word does give us the answer to this question. You just have to keep reading to Genesis chapter five. Genesis chapter five tells us that the days of Adam after he fathered Seth, Seth is the third son who is named in scripture, but not the only other child that Adam and Eve had, just the only other one that's named. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. So again, Cain, Abel, Seth, not the only kids Adam and Eve had. They had other children. Uh, we just don't know anything about those other children because we're, all we're told is they had other sons and daughters. So at the very beginning, you have Adam and Eve, you have their children. There is no one on earth for people to marry other than siblings marrying one another. And then eventually, you know, you can have cousins and nieces and so on and so forth. But at the very beginning, you have to have um, siblings marrying one another because there's nobody else to marry. Now, it's interesting to know, this isn't in the Bible, but um, Jewish tradition tells us that Adam and Eve had a lot of children, that they had, I believe it was 33 sons and 23 daughters. That's, that's a lot of kids, but it, they're living way longer lifespans than we are, so it makes sense that they could have had a lot of children. Um, so obviously, if you've got that many children, your sibling dynamics will be a little bit different with like, you know, 50 kids versus three. Uh, but... Uh, Putting, even putting that aside, if you read through Genesis and you pay attention to who marries who throughout the book of Genesis, you'll see that close intermarriages were very common throughout Genesis. Abraham married his half-sister Sarah, then his kids went on to marry close relatives and so on and so forth. So you really, you see that um, throughout the book of Genesis. So uh, where, so when did all of this change? Well, you get to the book of Leviticus where God puts an end to these close intermarriages. He gives all of these specific rules for who can marry who and puts an end to all of these close intermarriages. So why might that be the case? Well, if we think about this, we understand Adam and Eve created the very beginning. Um, they are created absolutely perfect. God is upholding his creation in a perfect way until 
sin and the curse enter creation. Now God is no longer upholding his creation in a perfect way, and our genetics, our DNA start to degrade, mutations start to creep in, and more time passes, the more mutations increase in our DNA. Um, so every generation has more mistakes than the generation before it, and those get passed on to the next generation who then get more mistakes, and that gets passed on, and the genetic load gets, gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Um, so 2,500 years after creation, when God gives the law to Moses and the nation of Israel, God puts these laws in place, um, stopping these close intermarriages. And from a genetic perspective, from a biological perspective, that makes sense. Now you've got a lot more mistakes in the DNA. People who are more closely related tend to share the same mistakes. So it makes sense that people should marry those who are more distantly related. We're all related through Adam, of course but more distantly related to one another. Um, so God puts those laws in place there in Leviticus chapter 18. But prior to that, super common for close relatives to marry one another. So even when it comes to answering questions like this, we always want to make sure we're going back to what does the word of God actually say? Um, and, and how can I answer this question based on the authority of God's word? Because God's word does give us the answers uh, that we need. So we've seen creation, God creating a perfect world, creating just two people, corruption, sin, and death entering creation. Then the third C there is catastrophe. That's, of course, the event of Noah's flood, where mankind becomes so wicked, God judges their wickedness with a global flood. But he saves Noah and his family aboard uh, Noah's ark. So here you have the human population uh, brought down to just eight people who survived the flood, right? So you've got a big genetic bottleneck there where we have just eight people surviving the flood. Everyone else, the Bible tells us, perishes in that judgment on sin. And this brings us to the fourth C, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on this uh, C here, and that's the C of confusion, Genesis chapter 11, otherwise known as the event of the Tower of Babel. So in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, eventually, they decided they didn't want to do that. Genesis chapter 11 tells us, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. That makes sense. They all come from the same family, so they speak the same language. And they said to one another, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. God had told them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. They're like, no, we're going to make a name for ourselves and not be dispersed over the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. So in judgment for their sin of refusing to spread out over the earth, like he told them to, their pride, their desire to make a name for themselves, God judges uh, their sin by confusing their languages, thus forcing them to obey him and spread out over the earth. So as people leave Babel and they sort of spread out over the earth, you're going to have eventually different people groups developing. Not different races, we're all one race, all descended from the same human couple, Adam and Eve, but different people groups because the event of the Tower of Babel split everyone up. But every single person traces their ancestry from the people at the Tower of Babel back to Noah and his family, from there back to uh, sons, and, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, and back to eventually Adam and Eve. We just have different people groups, again, because of the event of the Tower of Babel. And that's why in Acts 17, um, Paul says that God is made from one man, every nation of mankind, to um, live on all the face of the earth. Only one race. Some people wonder, okay, if, we're, if there's only one race... Everyone's descended from the same human couple. Why do we have different variations in different people groups all around the world? Why do we see, for example, specific eye-shaped variations in different people groups? Where does, that, where does that come from? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to talk a little bit about genetics. And um, so what I'm going to do for talking about genetics is we're going to pause talking about the people who went on Noah's Ark. And we're going to talk about the different animal kinds that went on Noah's Ark. Because I find that makes a very vivid illustration. And then we'll take the genetic principles that we learned there, and we're going to apply them to the people who went on Noah's Ark. So in the next like, you know, 15 minutes or so, what we're going to do is we're all going to get a PhD in genetics. Are you guys ready? Okay, awesome. All right, we got some enthusiasm. Love it. Okay, so here we go. So we're going to talk about those different animal kinds that went on to Noah's Ark. So we're talking about kinds here. So Noah did not have to take onto the Ark with him two poodles and two chihuahuas and two Great Danes and two Dalmatians and two St. Bernards. He only had to take two representatives of the dog kind. And there is a lot of variety within the dog kind, but dogs produce more. Anybody know? 
dogs. Good job. Way to go. You guys are well on your way to your PhDs. Good job. All right. Uh, this is the same for all the different kinds God made. Consider, for example, the cat kind. A lot of variety within cats. You've got the, the big cats like lions and tigers, and then you've got the smaller cats right down to, you know, your house cats and, and things like that. A lot of variety within cats, but cats produce more. Cats, very good. Um, and one way that we know organisms belong to the same kind is if they can interbreed with one another. There's other tests you can do, but one of those tests is, do they hybridize? Lions and tigers, for example, will hybridize and produce ligers or tigons. So we know they're part of the same original created kind. Uh, horse kind is another example, a lot of variety within horses. Uh, you have all of the different um, domesticated breeds that we have today, as well as some um, of the wild horses, as well as zebras are part of the horse kind. Um, and if you go down to the Ark Encounter and you visit Ararat Ridge Zoo, you can meet our Zorse and our Zonkey, where we have a zebra horse hybrid and a zebra donkey hybrid, because they're part of the same original uh, created kind. But let's zoom in on dogs. I love to use dogs as an example because there is so much variety within dogs and we're all extremely familiar with it. If we did a poll of everybody in the room right now and asked, what breed of dog do you have at home? We'd probably get, you know, 20, 30 different answers, right? Because there's so many different varieties, different breeds of dogs. And then of course you add in all of the different wild dog species as well. So much variety. Where does all this variety come from? Well, creationists and evolutionists would both agree that all of the different domesticated dog breeds that we have today, all of that variety came from a humans domesticating um, you know, some kind of wild dog, maybe something similar to a wolf, and then we breed the traits that we like to produce all of these different breeds that we have. So you, know, you want a little dog that's able to sit on your lap, so you breed these ones together that have those similar traits, then you breed the ones with those similar traits together until you get dogs that produce dogs that are small and able to sit in your lap, or you want dogs that are able to go on fox hunts are able to chase little critters out of the ground or whatever the case may be, we breed for those specific features. So we would argue Noah took two representatives of the dog kind onto the ark with him. In those representatives of the dog kind, you have all the genetic diversity that produces all of the different dog breeds that we have today. And you'll see this kind of thinking in evolutionary papers sometime. Obviously, we disagree with the timeline on, on this because we're going to stick with what the Bible says about uh, history. Uh, but from the journal Science here, the origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established, suggesting a single or, uh, common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. Or the journal Heredity, which says, based on genetic, morphological, and behavioral data, it is clear the domestic dog originates from the wolf. So in a biblical worldview, we understand that God created things according to their kinds. We see that all throughout Genesis chapter 1 when God is creating it. According to their kind, according to their kind, according to their kind. And then in Genesis 6, when the animals are going to come to Noah to go onto the ark, they're going to go onto the ark according to their kinds. Only the land-dwelling, air-breathing kinds had to go on Noah's ark, uh, by the way. It's not the millions and millions of species people think of. Only kinds and only the land-dwelling, air-breathing kinds. So what is exactly exactly is kind. Well, it's the Hebrew word mean, M-I-N, um, and we translate it in, in most English Bibles as kind, uh, and of course that's not how we classify things today, how we classify living things. We use this system, typically. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Now, kind is generally at the level of family. Sometimes it's at the level of order, sometimes it's at the level of genus, it can be a little higher, a little lower, but almost always it's at the level of family. So really good rule of thumb is if organisms belong to the same family, they probably belong to the same original created kind. So what that means is that when Noah took the animal kinds onto the ark, again, only the land-dwelling, air-breathing kinds, that's only about 1,398 kinds um, that had to go on to Noah's Ark, including the kinds that have since gone extinct. Uh, so that's less than 7,000 individual animals when you account for two of every kind, seven pairs of some. So not that difficult to fit less than 7,000 animals onto the absolutely massive Ark that God instructed Noah to build. So Noah takes two representatives of the dog kind onto the Ark with him. They survive the flood because God is gracious and merciful. They get off of the Ark, they spread around the world, eventually uh, humans domesticated dogs, and then we started breeding for all the different features that we like. And now you can find dogs in all different colors and all different shapes and all different varieties um, all around the world. Where does all that variety come from? Well, when humans are um, artificially selecting for different features to produce all these different dog breeds, humans are not going into dog's DNA and tinkering with the DNA and adding in things and making you know, some kind of weird Franken-dog from all these different parts, right? No, all of the information for 
all of the genetic diversity in all of these different breeds was already present in the dog kind. We just artificially selected for the features that we liked to produce all of these different breeds. Now, oftentimes, this kind of change within a kind is used as evidence for evolution. That's typically the evidence you'll see in textbooks. And if you're reading you know, um, the science news or reading a science magazine or something, you'll hear about these changes within a population. And you'll, see, you'll hear words like, that's evolution in action. We've observed evolution. Look, there's been change. But is that really what's happening here? Well, let's think about this in terms of some genetics. So we're going to use letters to represent genes that code for different features. So in this case, we've got big A's, little A's, big B's, little B's, big C's, little C's. Um, so you've got a male and a female here. Because of the way that reproduction works, um, the offspring get half their information from mom, half their information from dad. So you can have all these different possible combinations of information in the offspring, just depending on which genes they got from mom and which genes they got from dad. And this leads to variation within that kind. Now, if you think about it, as this you know, dog kind is reproducing and spreading out over the world after the flood, um, they're going to start adapting to different habitats. Now, as creatures adapt to a specific habitat, a specific environment, what generally happens is they lose genetic diversity. The more and more adapted a creature is to a specific habitat, the less genetic diversity they tend to have, um, because that's been lost along the way. And then, of course, as humans have domesticated dogs and then bred for certain features, what we've done is we've eliminated genetic diversity. And that's why, if you buy a purebred dog, you're typically going to have really high vet bills for that dog. There's going to be a lot more problems because there's a lack of genetic diversity in those particular um, breeds usually uh, because it's just been bred out of them. So there's no new information being added through natural selection or in the case of humans um, doing it, artificial selection. Um, nothing new is being added. It's just a different combination of already existing genetic information and then the loss of, of that information. So if you think about these two dogs coming off of the ark, they have puppies, their puppies have puppies, their puppies, puppies have puppies, their puppies, puppies, puppies have puppies, and soon you have a lot of dogs. It's too many dogs to live in one area, so they start to spread out, go to different parts of the world, you know, find new environments where there's not as much competition for resources. So let's zoom in on this cute little couple here. They fell in love, they got married, uh, and they're gonna have puppies. So we're, they both have S and L genes. We're gonna say that S represents short hair, L represents long hair, and if you have an S and an L gene together, it represents medium length hair, okay? So they have puppies. First one gets an S gene from mom, S gene from dad, has short hair. It looks different to the parents of course, but nothing new has been added. It's just a different combination of information, right? This one gets S gene from mom, L gene from dad, looks pretty similar to the parent. This one gets L gene from mom, L gene from dad, again, looks different from the parent, but nothing new has been added. Now, these puppies do what all good puppies eventually do. They move out of their parents' basement. They go out into the big wide world to make their way for themselves, and they decide, north. Let's head north. Let's see what kind of resources we can find up north. Now, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not originally from the United States. I'm originally from Canada. And I have lived up north, well, north from here, not north for being in Canada, to clarify. Uh, don't move to Canada. It's cold. It's very, very cold. You have two seasons. You've got cold and construction, and that's like it, right? So not a good choice to go north. But these dogs, they decided to head north. But as it turns out, if you have short hair or medium length hair, north wasn't a good option for you. Sadly, they die out of the population, and there's no more dogs with short hair or medium length hair. So on their own, those dogs can only produce more dogs with long hair because the variety has died out of the population due to natural selection. Similarly, if these puppies had decided, hey, let's go south instead, it looks great in the south, that wasn't a good choice for dogs with medium length hair or long hair. It's too hot there, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't great. They die out of the population. Now all you have left is dogs with short hair. And again, on their own, they can only produce more dogs with short hair because you've lost the genetic diversity for medium length hair and long hair due to natural selection. So when it comes to these shifts in populations, what's new? Well, nothing really, right? It's just different combinations of already existing information, the loss of information, and just the conservation of information that was already there, which is really the opposite of what you need for biological evolution. Because if you're going to change a single-celled organism into all of the different life forms that we have today, you need a process that's able to create massive amounts of brand new genetic information. Because as you know, that creature evolves into different things, now you have to code for a circulatory system. You've got to code for a nervous system. You've got to code for arms and legs and fins and feathers, whatever the case may be. You have to have genetic information in order to code for those. But there is no naturalistic process that, that we know about that can produce brand new functional 
mentioning genetic information. It just simply doesn't exist. Information comes from other information and ultimately comes from an information giver, which of course we understand to be the creator God. So evolution is really the opposite of natural selection. It needs the addition of brand new genetic information. Natural selection generally results in a loss of genetic information. And what's really interesting to note when it comes to our um, classification system that we use today, that kingdom, phylum, order, family, genus, species, is um, that a wolf and a coyote you see here on the screen, they look almost identical. Most people probably from a distance wouldn't even be able to tell they're looking at a wolf or a coyote, right? And yet they are considered to be um, separate species, although they do interbreed. You'll find koi wolves and things like that. But the Great Dane and the Yorkshire Terrier, which look absolutely nothing like each other, really, like we know they're dogs, but they really don't look anything like each other, they're considered to be part of the same species. All the domesticated dog breeds belong to just one species. Um, so there's greater diversity there between those breeds than there is between species. So you think about how much genetic information was already present in the dog kind when God created them to be able for humans in just a couple hundred years of artificial selection to produce things as different as a Great Dane and New Yorkshire Terrier, using information that was already there. God put a tremendous amount of genetic diversity into the different kinds he made so they'd be able to spread out and fill the earth. And that's why you could have representatives of the dog kind that live way up in the frozen Arctic and live in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Because God gave them so much genetic diversity so they could go out in a broken, falling world that's going to be radically changed by sin, radically changed by the flood, and adapt and fill the earth. It's all just a testimony to the wisdom of our great creator. So the two models I've laid out for you there, really, it's the, the evolutionary tree of life versus the creation orchard. The evolutionary tree of life says all of life is related to one another, going back to this, this common universal ancestor. The modern species are just sort of the tips on the ends of the branches. They all connect back to this main trunk, going back to this common ancestor. Versus the creation orchard view, which says God created things according to their kinds, like separate trees in an orchard, according to their kinds. There'll be a lot of diversity within a kind, you no know, branches on that tree, but the boundary is kind. One kind will not turn into another kind. So let's take all of that information we now have about genetics, the amount of diversity God built into his kind, and let's apply that to the people who got off of Noah's Ark. Um, Noah had three sons. They each had one wife. So you have three men, three women. Um, of course, they have kids. Their kids have kids. Their kids have kids. You can read all about that in Genesis chapter 10. Uh, and they're all gathered together in one place, Genesis chapter 11. God confuses their languages, and they start to spread out over the earth. Now, as those groups start to spread out over the earth, they're going to take with them different combinations of genetic information, right? No two groups are gonna take exactly the same combination of information. So you're gonna have different groups with different combinations going off to different parts of the world. And as they become isolated to one, from one another, at least for a time due to of course, the linguistic barrier. Then you also have geographical barriers. As people spread, there's a distance separating them. Then, you know, there's eventually there's mountains, there's oceans, there's rivers separating people. For a time, people are going to tend to marry within their own group. So you're going to have this distinct physical characteristics, that variety within each group becoming more prominent within a specific group, depending on what combination of information different groups took with them as they spread out over the earth. Now, oftentimes when it comes to issues regarding so-called race, uh, here in the United States, we typically think about this in terms of what's usually called skin color. And people wonder, okay, well, how do you have people who have black skin or white skin coming from the same human couple? Well, first, we have to really understand what we're talking about here, because we're not really talking about skin color. We're talking about different shades, because ultimately, every single person is the same basic color, and that is brown. All of us have a pigment in our skin called melanin. Now, obviously, it's the human body. It's super complicated. So we're taking the big, you know, picture view here. We're going to focus in on the main pigment, which is melanin. And it is a brownish pigment. And that is what gives you your specific shade of skin. If you have genes that code for the production of a lot of melanin, you'll have a very dark brown shade of skin. If you have genes that code for the production of a small amount of melanin, you'll have a very light brown shade of skin. And then there's all different variations in between, depending on what information you inherit from your parents. So if we think back to, okay, well, what did Adam and Eve look like? We're not wondering what color were Adam and Eve. Really, what shade of skin would Adam and Eve have been? Because we know they were brown, just like everyone else, but what shade might they have been? 
Well, if God created Adam and Eve at the very beginning with a very light brown shade of skin, let's say all little A's, little B's, there's not a lot of genetic diversity there, right? All of their children would have a very light brown shade of skin. That does not reflect the beautiful diversity we see around the world. Similarly, if God had created Adam and Eve at the very beginning with a very dark brown shade of skin, all big A's and big B's, again, not a lot of genetic diversity there. All of their children would have had a very dark brown shade of skin. Um, either of those lacks the genetic variation that we see in the world around us. But if God created Adam and Eve at the very beginning with a lot of genetic variation, with like a middle brown shade of skin, which is most of the world's population today, within just one generation, they could have children with a very light brown shade of skin, to a very dark brown shade of skin, to all different shades in between, depending on what information the kids inherit from their parents. Because again, half from mom, half from dad, you get all these different combinations of information. So let's, let's think, about, think of this in terms of those like Punnett squares you learned back in grade eight, okay? A very exciting, right? Uh, well, if you think about these different groups leaving Babel, if you've got one group that splits off from Babel and they're heading this way, and they have mostly big A's and big B's in their population, well, that group is gonna be dominated by those with a very dark brown shade of skin. Similarly, if you've got another group that splits off from Babel and most of the people in that group have, have all little A's and little B's, well, that group's gonna be dominated by those with a very light brown shade of skin. And then, of course, as people spread out and get isolated, people are gonna tend to marry within their own group and you're gonna have these particular physical characteristics becoming prominent within those specific groups. It's interesting, way back in 2002, National Geographic actually did a photo shoot where they took students who all went to the same school and they had those students line up in terms of different skin shade and showed that we're not talking about different colors here, we're just talking about different shades of skin on a continuum from light to dark to all these different beautiful shades in between. And this understanding explains why popping up in the news every so often, you find examples of twins who are born where one twin has a very light brown shade of skin and one twin has a much darker brown shade of skin. A lot of people wonder, how on earth can you have, have these twins who are born that look so different from one another? Well, it just has to do with genetics and what information each of those children inherited from their parents. And uh, again, like I said, these pop up in the news every so often. You see examples of this um, found in different places around the world. And it's easily explained when we properly understand genetics. So when it comes to looking at individuals like these, like this family here, they had twins twice, which in itself, that's a pretty amazing achievement. Um, and both times, they had one twin who had a lighter brown shade of skin and one who had a darker brown shade of skin. But we're not looking at like biracial twins here. What we're looking at is twins who belong to the same race, the human race. And we're just talking about what information they inherited from their parents when it comes to the genes that code for melanin production and skin shade. So no matter what people group we're looking at around the world, we're not looking at different races and trying to understand where do different races come from? It's different people groups, all descended from Adam and Eve through their children to Noah and his family from there to the event of the Tower of Babel that split up the human population. That is the biblical view of our anthropology, of, of where we came from, the study of man. When we start with God's word, we understand we all come from the same two people. We are all made in the image of God because that is how God made us at the very beginning, male and female in his image. And we are all marred by sin and the curse. We are sinners. We sinned in Adam. We continue to sin and we need the Lord Jesus. That is the biblical view of our anthropology. And that is a very different view than what you get when you start with the evolutionary worldview, right? In the evolutionary worldview, well, we're just animals. We just evolved over many millions of years. We're really no different from anything else in creation, maybe a little smarter, maybe a little better, but really no more value than bananas and fruit flies and aardvarks because we're just animals, just maybe a little more highly evolved. And then this happened over many millions of years. Our closest living relatives, of course, are the apes, and we descended from some kind of ape-like ancestor. That's the view of anthropology that absolutely dominates Western culture today. Uh, really this view that we are just animals. Now, of course, if we go back to sort of the origins of that, we are looking, of course, at Darwin and his writings. Um, Darwin's first book published in 1859 on this topic was called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Thankfully, titles have gotten a little bit shorter since then, <laughs> but it was very fashionable to have very long titles. Um, so we've called, we call it The Origin of Species now, but there's the full title for you there. And even there in the title, you see this idea of favored races struggling for life. Now, he's not talking about so-called human races there in the title. He doesn't talk about that in this book. But later on, he's going to take those principles and he's going to apply that to humans. Because in his book, he wrote, In the distant future, 
light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. He wasn't quite brave enough to talk about human evolution in his first book. Um, so he thought, you know, in the distant future, light's going to be thrown on where mankind came from. Well, the very distant future for Darwin was 13 years later when he published his book, The Descent of Man, where he took those evolutionary principles and he applies them to mankind to answer the question of where did man come from. Uh, now, because he's taking this idea um, of these different, you know, as we saw in the title, these favored races struggling for life, and he's going to apply that to mankind, we're going to see that thinking in his volume, The Descent of Man. Now, this is not to say, for example, you see, you see quotes like this from, from the late evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould, who says, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, the publication of Origin of Species, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. So this is not to say that Darwin was the world's first racist. That racism, prejudice, discrimination, favoritism has existed all around the world in all different cultures for all of human history history ever since the fall. Because ultimately, racism is not a skin issue, it is a sin issue. We do, first of all, we have a broken relationship with uh, our creator, and then we have a broken relationship with those around us. That is the ultimate cause of racism. It's the sin in our hearts that causes us not to love God as we should, not to love others as we should. But through Darwin's work, he provided a supposed scientific justification for a very particular kind of racism. So he introduced what we call today like um, scientific racism, where there was this supposed scientific basis for prejudice, for discrimination. So in his book, In the Descent of Man, he wrote, at some future period, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider. The Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian Aborigine and the gorilla. Pretty horrible stuff that he wrote, right? Where he saw different races that have struggled for survival, some are more highly evolved than others, and eventually due to natural selection and everything, eventually those groups in the middle are gonna be wiped out and we'll just have the more highly evolved races over here and then the apes and things over there. Really, really awful stuff. And that had a huge impact on the scientific community of his day and how people saw other individuals. It led to all kinds of horrible atrocities that took place where certain people groups who were believed to be less evolved were labeled as missing links or our primitive human ancestors that were put in zoos so people could go and look at them and see this missing link, this human ancestor. There were groups like the Australian Aborigines who were hunted down like they were animals and killed for scientific study and research because in their view, they're not as highly evolved as us. They are closer to the animals. They are closer to the apes. All kinds of horrible things took place as this idea started to catch on and people started to do research in order to quote unquote prove these ideas. Here in the United States, uh, a, there was a book called A Civic Biology. That was a textbook that was used widely throughout the United States. Um, this, one, this example here is from a quote from the 1914 version of A Civic Biology, where students were told that at the present time, there exist upon the earth five races, the highest type of all the Caucasians represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Tens of thousands of American high school students were taught as scientific fact that there are five races, this one is the highest race. That had an impact on how tens of thousands of young people saw others and saw themselves. And that was supposedly scientific. That was the science of the day. That was, that was you know, printed in textbooks because that's the truth, right? But You'd be really hard pressed today to find an evolutionist who agrees with that. Why is that? Well, it's because science did not confirm evolutionary ideas when it came to race. They were completely, totally, utterly wrong because they started with the wrong starting point, man's word, man's ideas, instead of the absolute infallible history that God has given us in his word that made it very clear that there's only one race. The Bible had been teaching that all along, that we are all descended from one man. Every nation of mankind is descended from the same man. And what really breaks my heart is that so many in the church at the time didn't go back to what God's word said. Instead of going back and saying, you know what? Maybe I don't have the answers from science for, for how to confirm what the Bible says, but the Bible's history is true. The Bible says there's only one race. The Bible says every single person is made in the image of God. Every single person is descended from Adam and Eve. So I'm gonna start with what the Bible says and not go with what the scientists of the day are saying. 
And as it turned out, the scientists of the day were very, very wrong, and the Bible was absolutely 100% correct. In the year 2000, researchers finished mapping our entire human genome, all three billion nucleotides of our DNA. And as they compared these different, uh, the different DNA of people from people groups all around the world, one of the things they discovered was there's only one race, the human race. Wow. The Bible had been saying that all along, right? Science always confirms the Bible. So they went on to say that if you ask what percentage of your genes is reflected in your external appearance, the basis by which we talk about race, the answer seems to be in the range of 0.01%. It is an incredibly small fraction of our DNA that codes for the differences that we see on the outside, an extremely small percentage of our DNA. They went on to say that um, the labels used to distinguish people by quote unquote race, have little or no biological meaning. I find it interesting that in this uh, American biology teacher handbook from 2011, so just under 100 years after that civic biology was published that we looked at, we read this. All humans are one race, homo sapiens. There is absolutely no genetic or evolutionary justification for racial categories of humans. In other words, evolution got it wrong. What was scientific fact in this textbook of less than 100 years ago, that's not the case anymore. Now we know there's only one race, and there's no genetic or evolutionary justification for these so-called racial categories of humans. Now, if they'd asked for my input when they wrote this book, which they didn't, uh, but if they had of, I would have told them what they needed to print there was, there's no evolutionary justification for this, and the Bible got it right all along, because the Bible has always taught that there's only one race. So we can take this term races that people love to use to, to divide uh, others up and, and put them into different categories. We can throw it right out. It isn't biblically accurate, first of all, and it is not scientifically, genetically, biologically accurate either. Science confirms God's word that there is only one race. So what does this mean in terms of how we understand the world around us? Well, it should impact our vocabulary because we want to be speaking truth. We want to be saying things that are true according to the word of God. And how we say things can be a really big witness to what we believe and to the truth of God's word and can start really great conversations with people. As they hear us communicating differently about something, that causes them to stop and think, wait a second, you just said it like this. Every time I hear it, it's like this. What do you mean by that? And then you can jump into what the word of God teaches about this. Some of those practical applications would be we can talk about people as being different shades, not different colors. Understanding we don't have black and white, we have different shades of the same basic color, brown. That we have different people groups all around the world, not different races, different people groups. That all people are colored because we're all colored the same, brown, just different shades. We don't have colored people and non-colored people. Everyone is just a different shade of brown. And we can understand that we are related to Everyone, not just our immediate family, not just our close family, we are related to everyone on the planet. Every single person is a descendant of Adam just as we are and therefore is our relative. And what that also means is that every single person is made in the image of God with an eternal soul that will live forever, either with Christ or for those who reject him apart from Christ. And that should burden us to share the message of the gospel with others, including those from every different people group all around the world. They need to hear about Christ. This should impact how we talk to our children about this issue. We want our children to think biblically. Uh, the world is working very, very hard to get kids to think a specific way on this issue. Um, the world's answer to this, of course, being uh, critical race theory, intersectionality, all of that kind of stuff is being pushed so hard in the public education system. And all that it's doing is dividing people up from one another. We need to be teaching our children to think biblically about this issue. One way we can do that is perhaps use um, the popular children's course you've probably sung to your kids or maybe sung to your grandkids at some point. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious and, uh-oh. Right there in this song, we see that evolutionary idea that there are different races of humans divided up according to their skin color. We do not want to be promoting an evolutionary worldview to our children in the things that we say to them and the things that we sing to them. We want to be speaking and singing truth. So a great way that you can use this to teach your children the truth about um, humanity from God's word is to change the lyrics a little bit. Something like this, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world world, shades of brown from dark to light, all are precious in his sight. And we can use that to teach our children biblical truth, the truth that we are all indeed one race, all just different shades of the same basic color, brown. This should impact how we talk about uh, the issue of so-called interracial marriage. All right, guys, got a pop quiz for you here. If we are all one race, is there such a thing as interracial marriage? 
No, absolutely, there cannot be, because according to God's word, there's only one race. So you can't have interracial marriage if you are marrying a human being. I say that because it's 2023. People think they can marry trees and bridges and lamps and all kinds of crazy things. If you are marrying a human being as, you know, God's word is defined marriage, one man for one woman for life, there is no such thing as interracial marriage because we are all one race. Now, sometimes when it comes to this issue, people will point to the Old Testament and they'll say, wait, 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 wait. God told the Israelites when they took over the land of Canaan not to marry into the, the nations there. To, uh, they, they should be marrying Israelites. So it, isn't that God saying marry within your own group? Well, you have to look at the context, right? Context is always key when it comes to biblical interpretation. When we look at the context of those commands that God gave to the nation of Israel, those commands, God couches them in terms of the land that you are going into is filled with people who are extremely sinful, who are extremely wicked, who are committing all kinds of atrocities. If you go in and you start marrying into those cultures, what's going to happen? That sin is going to start impacting you. You guys are going to start going away from me and you're going to commit all kinds of awful atrocities. Because one of the reasons God was sending the Israelites into the land of Canaan to take that land that he had promised Abraham was because he was judging the people who lived there because they were so incredibly wicked. So if you know your Old Testament history, you know the Israelites had a really hard time obeying what God said, right? We're not much different today than they were back then. They had a very hard time obeying God. They ended up marrying into the nations around them. And exactly what God said would happen is exactly what happened. And they fell into sin and committed all kinds of things. And eventually God judged them for their sin. And so that was the reason God gave that command. It had nothing to do with, with, with ethnicity. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with the spiritual condition of the people who lived there. And we get hints of that when we, when we read certain accounts in Scripture. For example, um, in Joshua 6, when uh, the, the nation of Israel are going into the Promised Land, their first conquest is the walled city of Jericho. We're probably all familiar with that account, right? Um, eventually, the Israelites take over Jericho by God's mighty hand. Um, but there's an interesting account there about Rahab, who hid the spies who'd gone into Jericho, saved them. Them. Um, and so she and her family were rescued from the destruction of Jericho. And she actually ended up marrying an Israelite man. And she's found in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But that wasn't a problem because Rahab stopped being a Canaanite spiritually and became an Israelite spiritually because she trusted in the one true God. Same for Ruth. She was a Moabitess, right? But she chose to trust in the God of Israel, so it was perfectly fine for Boaz to marry her because she trusted in God. And she's also found in the genealogy of Jesus. So this had everything to do with spiritual condition, had nothing to do with ethnicity. And we see that from the word of God. So as we've been going through the history that God has given us in his word, that it really explains our anthropology. We've seen God created everything. He created just two people at the very beginning, made in his image. Everyone is descended from those two people. They sinned against God, brought death and suffering into creation. Then you have the event of the flood, just eight people survive. Uh, then you get to the event of the Tower of Babel, where the human population is divided. This is where we see different people groups developing around the world. And that brings us to the last three seas of history. And that, of course, is Christ. Jesus Christ comes, fully God, fully man, lives the perfect life that none of us can live, and then cross cho chooses to go and die on the cross in our place. He took that punishment of death that we deserve because of our sin on himself when he died on the cross. Then he rose from the grave, conquered sin and death, and now offers the free gift of eternal life to everyone who will turn away from their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus. And the final C, consummation, big fancy word, means Jesus is coming again. He's going to make a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more death or suffering or pain. It is properly understanding biblical history, what God has told us in his word about where we come from, and then understanding the message of the gospel. That is the answer that we need for this issue of racism impacting our culture today. We understand that starting with God's word, it's a biological fact that all humans are just one race. But then we also have to understand the spiritual fact that all humans are divided into what we could say two races, two spiritual races. And what's the difference between those two? Well, the difference between those two, of course, is the direction in which they're racing. There's only two options. Either you are running on the broad way that leads to destruction, away from Christ, away from his mercy and grace that would save you, or you're running on the narrow way that leads to life, running towards Jesus Christ, accepting the free gift that he offers of eternal life with him and forgiveness from our sins. Those are the only two options, and every single human being is on one of those two roads. 
the broad way or the narrow way. It's really popular today to think there's all these different ways that lead to God and you just, you know, it doesn't really matter what path you're on, eventually you'll get there. The Bible is very clear. There's only two paths and only one, the one that goes through the Lord Jesus Christ who is the door, the way, the truth, the life. Only that one leads to the Father, leads to reconciliation with God and leads to the hope of eternal life with him. And every single human being is on one of those two paths. And because we're related to every human being, we know their, their, their spiritual condition. That should so burden our hearts to want to reach others with the message of the gospel. Understanding that because we're all related to that first Adam, Every single one of us is a sinner. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you belong to, what your lived experience is. Every single person has the same ultimate problem. They're a sinner in rebellion against God, and they desperately need the Lord Jesus Christ, who came as the last Adam to take our penalty of death, then rise again and offer eternal life and forgiveness to everyone from every nation and tribe and people and language who will turn from their sin and put their faith and trust in him. As believers, we need to look past the genetics, the things we see on the outside. Our culture makes a huge deal about those things on the outside and divides people up into different categories based on simply what they look like on the outside. What we need to be doing as believers is looking at people as God looks at them and understanding there's so much going on inside of a person outside of what they look like on the outside. In 1 Samuel 16, when God is selecting through, through the prophet Samuel, the new uh, king of Israel, God says, do not look on his appearance on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. That's still true of us today, right? But the Lord looks on the heart. And we need to do the same. We need to understand that every single person we're talking to is an eternal soul with an eternal destiny. And the only answer for every single person is Jesus Christ and the gospel. Understanding those first four C's, creation through confusion, is vital for laying a proper biblical understanding of mankind. But those last three C's, Christ, cross, and consummation, is absolutely vital for understanding the answer to racism. And it's the gospel. Spoiler alert, it's always going to be the gospel. The gospel is always the answer. When we come to Christ and we repent and put our faith and trust in him, we're given a new heart, is what the Bible tells us. We're a new man in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, behold, the new has come. We're given a power by his Holy Spirit to forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. When we recognize how much the God of the universe who we have sinned against, how much he has forgiven us, that, that he takes our sins and separates them as far as us as the east is from the west and he remembers them no more. When we recognize how much we've been forgiven by God, that gives us a new power by his spirit to forgive others for the things that they have done against us. When we love God as God has commanded us to, the first and greatest commandment, right? When Jesus was asked, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. When we love God as he has called us to, then we have a new power by his spirit to love others as he has called us to. It's the gospel that is the answer. It is the gospel that a broken, hurting world that is so divided desperately needs. Because the New Testament is very clear that in the gospel, we are all united. All the things that once maybe separated us, made us different from one another, in Christ, none of that matters anymore. Because we are all one. We are part of the one body of Christ in him. And the book of Revelation talks about a time when those from every nation and tribe and people and language will be gathered before the throne of the Lamb. And we are going to worship and praise him for what he has done in rescuing those from every Every nation and tribe and people and language will put their faith and trust in him. That is the beautiful, diverse, wonderful future that we have to look forward to as those who have put their faith and trust in Christ. And that's the message our culture needs. And I pray that as a church, that is the message that we will be sharing, that we will be standing on God's word and always starting with what the scriptures say and using that as a lens, not worldly philosophies, not things based on man's opinion that are popular today that'll be gone tomorrow that change constantly, using the eternal, perfect, infallible word of God as the lens through which we view the world so we can boldly and unashamedly speak to others, sharing the truth, and above all, sharing the message of the gospel with them.